Chapter 8 Underwater The sign on the door said, Room F. Normally the signs were a bit more helpful and gave us at least some idea what we might expect inside. Room F, said Tobias. I don't like the sound of that. It was day three of training, and last I heard, we were down to 83 candidates. My name hadn't appeared on the board yet, and neither had Tobias's. It was the first thing you did every morning. Check the board, sigh with relief, send a sympathetic glance to the fellows who got chopped, then hit the showers. Maybe I should have felt proud of myself, but some of the tests were so strange, it was hard to know how well I was making out. So far, I'd managed to hold on, but it was early days yet, and now we had room F to reckon with. I took a deep breath, stepped inside, and stopped short. Room F was a lecture hall, with a chalkboard at the front and rows of little desks with astronaut trainees squeezed inside. It seemed as if all the groups were being brought together for this session. Some of the other fellows looked as confused as I felt. We were used to diabolical machines and endurance tests. Standing down at the front were Captain Walken and a small, dejected-looking man with spectacles, leaning on a cane. It's just like school, said Tobias with terror in his voice. I think I'd rather do another land dive. We found two desks at the back, each of which held a notebook and two sharpened pencils. Let's begin, please, said Captain Walken. Ah, welcome, ladies. I turned around in surprise to see Kate and Miss Simpkins entering the classroom. Gentlemen, said Captain Walken. Allow me to introduce Miss Kate DeVry and Miss Marjorie Simpkins. Miss DeVry is an expert on high-altitude zoology, and I'm very pleased to tell you she'll be joining our expedition. So Kate's plan had worked. Her parents had given their consent. I can't say I was surprised. Kate was almost supernaturally skilled at getting what she wanted. Good morning, everyone, said Kate sitting at the desk beside mine without giving me a glance. Mr. Lunardi has very kindly allowed me to sit in on some of your sessions. The other fellows didn't seem to mind at all. They were smiling and sitting up straighter at their desks. But I was surprised by my own contrary mix of feelings. I was always hungry to see more of Kate, but I didn't want her here. This was my testing grounds, and I didn't want her to see me if I looked foolish or too young or if I failed. It was bad enough that she got to be part of the expedition without lifting a finger to prove herself. Why did she have to come and gawk at us like a tourist? Now, to business, said Captain Walken. Without the know-how of this gentleman beside me, we wouldn't be going to outer space. This is Dr. Sergei Turgenev, and he will be the chief science officer aboard ship. Our expedition will take us into a new world, and Dr. Turgenev has a great deal to share with you. After all my months at the academy, I felt quite at home behind my desk, but I could see that some of the other fellows were ill at ease. Dr. Turgenev limped forward, leaning on his cane. He wasn't old, no more than forty, but he gave the impression of being crumpled. His long face was made even longer by his goatee. He sighed deeply. His spectacles were flecked with dandruff. I am very excited to be among you, he said in mournful, heavily accented English. So I am here to tell you about outer space. He turned his back on us and went to the chalkboard. Splinters of chalk exploded from his hand as long strings of numbers and symbols scrolled across the board. I glanced over at Kate and saw her eagerly copying everything down in her notebook. The other candidates stared at the board in horror. I knew how they felt. I'd never seen some of the symbols that appeared there like malevolent hieroglyphs. Now, someone complete equation for me, if you please, 
said Dr. Turgenev, turning to face the class. I am sorry, this is insultingly simple. I promise we get more challenging. Anyone? I glanced over at Kate, but even she wasn't going to take a whack at it. No one? said Dr. Turgenev. I am very disappointed. He stared at us dolefully. Then something strange happened to his face. At first I thought he was having some kind of seizure, but then I realized he was trying to smile. I am just kidding. This is joke. What I have written on board is meaningless. Complete gibberish. We all looked around at one another uncertainly. Captain Walken told me it is a good idea to begin with joke. So that is my joke. And now I think we are all more relaxed. And I begin to tell you about outer space. He wiped the chalkboard clean with his brush and drew a circle. Here is our planet. Around it we have sky. And above sky we have outer space. Where does it begin? We must find out. What is this outer space? What is it made of? Is it liquid? Is it gas? Now, 35,000 feet is highest humans have gone. At this height, air pressure is much lower. I calculate it gets even lower, higher we go. It's possible that in outer space there is no pressure at all, but we will see. When Kate and I salvaged the Hyperion last year, we'd been as high as 20,000 feet. And I knew what a hostile place it was, almost airless and extremely cold. I could scarcely imagine what it would be like beyond that. Ship will be pressurized. Dr. Turgenev continued, and supplied with heat and air. But when you venture outside ship... We're going outside the ship? Reg Perry asked in alarm. Yes, certainly. Not me, of course. I have weak lungs. But astronauts will be first men in space, and so we create special suits for you. Uh, they bring one up now. There was a knock at the door. Ah, here it is, said Dr. Turgenev. He opened the door. Front of class, please, he told the assistant. We all watched as a wooden mannequin wearing an enormous puffy silver suit was wheeled into the room. It was extremely shiny and reminded me of an oversized Christmas tree ornament. The mannequin beamed at us, obviously very pleased with his spacesuit. I am not wearing that, said Bronfman, and some of the other fellows laughed. I am very sorry to hear this, said Dr. Turgenev, because without suits, you die. First, lungs explode. Then, gases in your tissue expand, and you swell to twice normal size. Water on your eyes and tongue boils, and then mouth and nostrils freeze. After that, you lose consciousness and die within seconds. Oh, he added with a yawn, there is also possibility blood boils. There was a moment of heavy silence. That is one fine-looking suit, said Bronfman, and I have a feeling it comes in just my size. I glanced at Tobias and rolled my eyes. Outside ship, Dr. Turgenev continued, we get extreme temperatures. Very hot in sunlight. Very cold in shade. Suit is your astral skin. It keeps body at the right pressure and keeps your oxygen. Excuse me, said Chuck Shepard, but when do we see the ship? Dr. Turgenev gave a weary sigh. Oh yes, yes, ship. Everyone is curious about spaceship. I think we'd all like to have a look at it, Shepard said. Mutters of agreement rose from the audience. 
The other trainees, I noticed, paid close attention when Shepard spoke. He was a man of few words, but already, even on the third day, everyone looked to him as the standard we were all trying to achieve. You do not need to see ship yet, said Dr. Turgenev, glancing a bit nervously at Captain Watkin, who stood off to one side, listening. So far, Shepard said, polite but persistent, I've been dropped, spun, iced, poked, and prodded, but I thought I was here to fly. We know you can fly, Mr. Shepard, said Captain Walken. The purpose of this training is to determine your overall fitness for outer space. Yes, sir, said Shepard respectfully. It just seems funny we can't see the actual ship. We're hankering to take her for a little spin, said Bronfman. Captain Walken nodded patiently. I'm sorry to disappoint you, gentlemen, but the ship isn't here. She's undergoing final preparations at the launch site, which, for obvious reasons, is being kept secret. Now please, listen to what Dr. Turgenev has to tell you. The gloomy scientist continued his lecture, relating each fact like a great tragedy. All the same, he gave us plenty of information about gravity, and atmospheric composition, and pressure, and vacuums, and orbital velocity. I can't say I understood all of it, but I got the gist of most of it, or so I hoped. Whenever I glanced over at Kate, she was listening intently, her busy little pen whisking across her notebook. I started to wonder if the lecture was actually just another test, this time to see who could stay awake the longest. The sunshine poured through the windows, and the room became awfully warm. Some of the men I noticed were propping their heads on their hands and kept lurching forward. A little paper ornithopter touched down on my desk, and I looked over to see Kate staring innocently straight ahead. Luckily, Miss Simpkins was dozing, and we were both in the last row of seats, so I didn't think anyone else saw. I glimpsed some handwriting on the ornithopter and quietly unfolded it. In Kate's neat penmanship was a short message. I'm coming. Told you my plan would work. Aren't you pleased? I gave her a quick nod and wink, then pushed her note under my book and turned back to Dr. Turgenev's drone. But I was aware of Kate's eyes boring into the side of my head. I couldn't believe it. She wanted a message back. Maybe she could listen to the lecture, take notes, and chat all at the same time, but I knew I couldn't. I dragged out her bit of paper and quickly wrote, Very pleased. Let's hope I'm coming too. I didn't bother refolding the ornithopter, just crumbled up the paper a bit and tossed it onto her desk when no one was looking. She wrote back, Paying attention in class would be a good start. I looked at her in annoyance, and she smiled sweetly. I sat up straighter and focused on Dr. Turgenev. Down near the front, one large fellow was flamboyantly asleep on his desk, and as I watched, he began to slide out of his seat. Just before he spilled out onto the floor, he woke with a shout. How's boss? he said. I know, I know, said Dr. Turgenev, turning from the chalkboard. These equations are very exciting for me also, but I am done for a moment. Now I think some of you go for swim. I thought Dr. Turgenev was joking, until Grendel Erickson appeared at the door of the lecture hall and told us we were going to the pool. Dread settled over me. Enjoy your swim, Mr. Cruz, Kate said. Thank you, Mr. Vry. Good day. You know her then. Tobias asked as we headed off with our group. I grunted. I met her a couple years ago aboard the Aurora. What happens in the pool? Have you heard? He shook his head, then looked at me closely. Are you all right? In a low voice, I said, I can't swim. Not at all? I can thrash about for a while before I drown. Just stick close to me, Tobias said. I felt awfully grateful to him. But I didn't want to spoil his chances of doing well, and if we had to do laps or some kind of endurance test, I didn't really see how he could help me. 
In the changing room, they handed us swimming gear, and we stripped off our clothes. What are they doing here? Tobias muttered. I followed his gaze, and my spirits sank even lower. Bronfman and Shepard must have joined our group. Every day as the number of trainees shrank, the groups were evened out. I'd be competing directly against these two every day now. I sighed. At least Kate wasn't here to see me humiliate myself in the pool. Captain Walken and a team of assistants were waiting for us on the deck. I was tall, and I'd started to fill out, but I still felt boyish beside all the other, bigger men in their swim gear. One thing you'll experience in outer space, the captain said, is reduced gravity. Dr. Turgenev predicts complete weightlessness beyond a certain altitude. Moving about inside the ship will be one challenge. Moving around outside will be quite another. Here on Earth, we can't perfectly simulate weightlessness, but we can come close underwater. So suit up, gentlemen, and let's take a walk in outer space. Eleven spacesuits hung from the wall like the skins of silver giants. Resting on a shelf above each suit was a helmet with a mirrored visor. I didn't like the idea of getting inside one of those, but I was hugely relieved we weren't actually swimming. Maybe I wouldn't end up making a fool of myself after all. Though the suit was flexible at the joints, it had a rigid layer of rubber insulation inside, and getting it on was a struggle. Last year, while working aboard the Hyperion at 20,000 feet, I donned a snow leopard sky suit that felt as comfortable as a second skin. But in this spacesuit, I was heavy and clumsy, and uncomfortably hot. An assistant had to help me pull on my boots and gauntlets, and lock the airtight metal collar into place. All that remained was the helmet. On the edge of the deck was a huge machine sprouting lengths of narrow hosing. Captain Walken took hold of one and held it up. This is your umbilicus, he told us. One end's connected to the ship, the other to the back of your suit. It supplies you with oxygen and carries away the carbon dioxide you exhale. It also keeps your suit pressurized. The assistants led us over to the air pump and started attaching our umbilicuses. Once your helmets are on, Captain Watkins said, we'll be lowering you into the pool. Your boots have metal soles, so you will sink quickly. When you touch down, we'll inflate your suits a bit to make you as near weightless as possible. You each have three very simple tasks to complete. Now that I was close to the edge, I could see the pool's deep bottom. All manner of machines and hulking bits of equipment had been bolted down there. It looked like a strange underwater factory. You'll each see a closed hatch in front of you, said Captain Walken. It matches the main hatch on our spaceship. To open it, you'll need to turn the wheel to the right. Then you'll need to pass through the hatchway. On the other side, you must pick up a red box, come back through, and return to the surface. That's all? asked Bronfman with his usual cocky grin. That's all, said Captain Walken. But I think you may find moving quite challenging. When you're ready to surface, or if you have any difficulties, place both hands atop your helmet. We'll inflate your suit, and you'll be buoyed to the surface. Each of you has a knife in the pouch at your hip in case of emergency. Good luck, gentlemen. Let's get to it, said Shepard. I glanced over at Tobias. You'll feel right at home down there, I said. He sent me an encouraging wink, and then an assistant approached with my helmet. I felt a hot flash of panic. I never liked things covering my face. Ready? the assistant asked. I nodded. Not at all ready. The helmet came down, and I swallowed as all sound was suddenly muted. I heard the clamp snap shut against the metal collar of my suit. Almost immediately there was a low hiss. My ears popped, and I felt cool air from the umbilicus playing against my back. My mouth was dry. I felt sealed off from the world, the voices on deck dull and distant. My heart pounded in my ears. My assistant guided me beneath one of the many little cranes that jutted out over the pool. 
A line was hooked to the back of my suit. My assistant gave me the thumbs up, which I repeated back to him. And then I was hoisted up and swung out over the water. Slowly I was lowered. It was strange to see the water rising over my legs and waist without feeling any wetness at all. For a moment, I bobbed up and down, until one of the safety divers unhooked me from the crane and I sank swiftly. The water rose over my visor, and as it passed my nose, I held my breath. I saw Tobias sinking beside me, and all the other trainees, their white umbilicuses trailing from their backs. I was used to the open air, and I didn't like being surrounded by water. My visor was steamy from my panting. I landed clumsily on the pool bottom, teetering. The hatch was before me, no more than ten feet away. I felt my suit inflate, giving me more buoyancy. My feet still touched bottom, but scarcely. I tried to walk, but just slewed about, uselessly. Guide rails had been bolted to the pool floor. I grabbed hold of one and dragged myself forward. To my right I saw Tobias moving like a silver aquatic animal, already at his hatch. Darting around in the water watching over us were several safety divers. I knew Grendel Erickson was among them. They didn't have clipboards, but I was sure they were busy taking mental notes. Laboriously, I hauled myself closer to the hatch and seized the wheel in my puffy gauntlets. I gave it a turn, but the only thing that turned was me. My legs swirled up off the floor and kept going till I was upside down, still clutching the wheel. I felt a complete fool. Of course the wheel wasn't going to turn unless I was anchored in place. Now that I was upside down, I could see, on the pool bottom, numerous metal footholds. I pulled again on the wheel and managed to get myself right way up. I hope none of the safety divers had seen this. Across the pool, I could make out several trainees with their hatches open. Shepard and Bronfman, probably. But Tobias, I was happy to see, was ahead of all of them. He had already skimmed through. With difficulty, I managed to wedge my clunky boots into two footholds. Despite the cool air in my suit, I was already drenched with sweat. Legs tensed, I turned the wheel, pulling with my whole body. It was amazing how difficult it was to do things when weightless. Now to get inside. With one hand, I grabbed a handle beside the hatch. With my other hand, I pushed the hatch. Slowly, it moved back and to the side. The opening was none too large, and I felt bulky as a whale. Feet first or head first? I decided on feet first. Still holding on to the handle, I slipped my boots out of the footholds and managed to get my legs up and aimed at the opening. Then I pulled. It was going well, and I was halfway through when I felt the back of my suit scraping against the hatch's rim. It brought me to a halt. I gave another hard pull on the handle, trying to get my body clear, and felt something give at the back of my suit. I twisted around sluggishly as I drifted through the hatchway, and saw the severed end of my umbilicus, undulating like an eel and spewing great bubbles of oxygen into the pool. I felt water on my back, then my legs and feet. I was filling with water! I felt it glugging coldly down each of my legs and pulling in my boots, weighing me down. I made a grab for my umbilicus, but it was thrashing about over my head, out of reach. I tried to pull off from the bottom and grab it, but my suit was already too full of water. It was up to my waist now. I looked about wildly, but everyone I could see was still intent on their tasks. Their visors turned away from me. Tobias was nowhere to be seen. Where were the safety divers? I put both my hands atop my helmet, then churned the water with my arms. Hey! I shouted. Help! The water was at my lower ribs. Soon it would be at my neck, and then it would fill my helmet. I would drown inside my suit. I needed to get out of it. My clumsy gauntlets clutched uselessly at my suit, and then panic mastered me, and I was shouting and raging. All at once, two safety divers were alongside me. They took hold of my suit and tried to haul me to the surface, but I was too heavy. I saw one shake his head, and the other fellow streaked up to the surface. Maybe he was going for the winch line, but it would be too late by the time he returned. The water was at my neck, in my mouth. 
I tilted my face, trying to keep my nose clear. I sucked in one last breath, and then the water gurgled above my nostrils and filled the helmet to the top. The water blurred my vision, but when my severed umbilicus suddenly jetted past, I managed to grab it. Air bubbled from its end. Despite my terror, I had a sudden small moment of calm. I knew there was no point trying to plug the umbilicus back into the suit. It was full of water, and the water had nowhere to go. My knife! I clutched the umbilicus tight in one hand, and with my other hand, tugged the knife from its pouch. I didn't know how much longer I could hold my breath. Without hesitation, I plunged the blade into the neck of my suit, cutting deep through the rubber lining, in the process, jabbing my own flesh. I dropped the knife, took the umbilicus in both hands, and jammed it into the gash I'd made. It wasn't a perfect fit, but it was good enough. I heard bubbling as the pressure from the hose started pushing the water out through the torn umbilicus opening at the back of my suit. I tilted my head and could see the water dropping in my helmet. I strained, lifting my face as high as I could, needing to breathe. My forehead was clear, and then my nose was clear, and I snorted back air. The water dropped to my chin and stopped, but I knew I was all right now. The other diver appeared with a line and hooked it to my suit. Then I was hauled up. The moment I broke the surface, they had my helmet off, and I was hoisted, gasping and sputtering, onto the deck. Captain Walken and Chuck Shepard caught hold of me and helped me onto a bench. Bronfman and Tobias rushed over to help. Are you all right? The captain asked, taking me by the shoulder. His forehead creased. You're bleeding. I looked and saw a rivulet of watery blood running down over my silver suit. For the first time, I felt a narrow throb of pain. My neck, I said. I had to cut a hole. Shepard swiftly opened up my suit and checked my wound. It's not deep. Won't even need stitches. What happened? Captain Walken asked me. His umbilicus tore, said Grendel Erickson, hauling himself out of the pool. Suit filled with water. He had the sense to grab his hose and cut an opening for it. Gave himself enough air to breathe. That was quick thinking, Cruz, said Shepard. Lucky you didn't slit your throat, said Bronfman. I'm sorry, Matt, said Tobias, looking pale. I didn't see. I was just coming out. There must have been a flaw in the suit, said Captain Walken, and he sounded as angry as I'd ever heard him. It shouldn't have torn so easily. I want all the suits checked again before anyone else goes down. See to it, Mr. Erickson. Yes, sir. I was grateful to the captain, for I couldn't help feeling it was my own fault. I'd seen Tobias swishing through the hatch like a sea lion, and I'd hurried, not wanting to fall so far behind. I was careless. Shepard gave me a sympathetic clap on the shoulder, but I wondered what he really thought behind that inscrutable expression of his. Erickson got the first aid kit and patched me up. As I saw more of the trainees emerge from the pool, some holding their red boxes, I couldn't help feeling like I'd failed. Don't blame yourself, Matt, Tobias said in the changing room. Your gear let you down. I nodded, but wasn't convinced. Underwater, I hadn't thought clearly. I'd felt my panic, crouching like a tiger ready to leap. How do you do it? I asked him. Concentrate down there. I saw you, the way you moved. You want to know my secret? He asked quietly. I nodded. I pretend I'm a shark. Really? No, he said, laughing at the surprise on my face. There's no secret. I've spent a long time down there, that's all. It feels like my element. Just like being in the sky doesn't bother you. More practice, that's all you need. My helmet makes me feel like I can't breathe. I bet you were holding your breath. I exhaled. I'm sure I was. On and off. Don't, he said. Your body has enough air. You just have to tell your mind that. Now, any tips for the parawing jumps coming up? Yeah, I said. Just pretend you're lighter than air. <laughs>